This evening our topic is a question that was posted about whether we as human beings do we have free will or we don't? If we do, what are there evidences from the Quran or Hadith or intellect? If we don't, what are the proofs? And before I proceed, let me say that this topic is very, very hard topic in Aqaid. Very, very important debate among our scholars. So as we try to present, I want us to open not only our eyes, also our heart and mind to hear the evidences and also the proofs from the all the school of thought, inshallah. This topic, as we mentioned in Aqaid, the way they put the question is this. هل الإنسان مخير أم مسير؟ That's the question. هل الإنسان مخير أو مسير؟ Meaning, is human being has does human being has free will or no? He doesn't have a free will. That is the topic. Before I proceed to the answer, whether yes or no, let me say when this question is posted, whether human being has free will or not, there are three different school of thought, three opinions about this, this particular question. The first opinion about this are a group of Muslims who they are known in Aqaid, they are called Al Mujbira or Al Jababira. It's the same name, but different words. They are called Al Mujbira or Al Jababira. This group, when they were asked this question, they said they believe that human being has no free will. As a matter of fact, according to their opinion, they say whatever we do in this world is Allah's work. Not you and I. You and I, if you decided to do your namaz today, it's not your decision, it's Allah's decision. If somebody decided today to go to go and steal somebody's money, it's not his decision or her decision, it's a decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But bear in mind, these people when they say this, don't think that they don't think or they don't have any proof. Insha'Allah, I'll give you some of their proof from the Quran, which also makes sense. But among the sense, there is sense, all right? Somebody smart, there is somebody smarter. So they have their proofs, but there are powerful proof over what they have, right? So they say that whatever you and I do in this world is not your choice or my choice. They say it's Allah's opinion and the choice 
and you and I have nothing to do with it. They have from the Quran in Surah Safat. This is the proof from the Quran. That there is one ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma ta'maloon. Allah created you and created what you do. So Allah stated that, so what is Safat? That He created you and created what you do. Now you drink water, Allah created it. So why am I to be blamed? If I go to, to the school and learn something, it's not my choice, it's Allah's choice. May everything that you do is not about you, it's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the proof number one. Proof number two from the Quran. When Allah said to the Prophet, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى In the battle of Badr, Allah said to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, remember at the battlefield when you were shooting the enemies, Allah said, you are not the one who is doing the shooting. I am the one who is doing the shooting. So if Allah is saying, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ Remember when you were throwing those arrows at the enemy? Allah said, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ You didn't throw. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى Now actually in the battlefield, who was throwing? Rasulullah. But Allah said, this action is not your action, it's my action. So that indicates that we don't have free will. Whatever we do, it's Allah's work and it's not us. That is proof number two from the Quran. Now from the hadith wise, also there is hadith that is quoted that as soon as a woman conceived a baby, immediately Allah writes four things about that baby. Immediately. As soon as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started the creation of that baby, four things is written. And these four things, he or the mother or the father has no hands in it. It's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word. Number one, the first thing Allah writes about that person is to write his deeds, a'mal. Sa'idun am shafiyun. That is the hadith. That if the person, Allah, decides, do I want him to be a good person? Then Allah makes him a good, right, good person. If Allah wants him to be a bad person, then it's wrote that he is a bad person. It's not his choice, or the mother, or the father. It's Allah's choice. That's number one, Allah writes about him. Number two, then Allah writes about his risk, sustenance. What is he going to eat? What is he going to give? What comes in to him? What does he lose? Every single detail from the day Allah created him to the day he dies, Allah writes every details about his risk. That is number two. Number three, then Allah writes his ajal. When will he die? Because this one thing that Allah SWT writes it down, you and I have no anything to, we have nothing to do with that. Allah is the one who writes how many years you will live, how many months somebody can live, how many how many weeks, it's all his son. Then Allah writes the Everything about the ajal of that person. That is number three. And number four, then Allah writes good and bad that will happen to that person. Khair and sharr. What good thing will happen in your life? What bad will happen in your life? Allah writes all these details and you and I have no saying in this whatsoever. That is from the hadith one. So in this regard, there are some ayahs and then some of the ahadith also which indicate that we as a human being, we have no free will. Whatever we do is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word. That is proof number one. Before I go to number two, let me emphasize that this part of this school of thought is started by Bani Umayyah. Bani Umayyah, the Umayyahs, they are the ones who planted the seed of Al-Jabr. Why? Because they want control. How does it relate with control? Now oh, listen careful. If they say this, that Allah does everything, right? Now, they kill Muhammad, or they kill Ali, or they put him in the prison. Can you blame them? No, because Allah is the one who does everything. He is the one, if he kills somebody, Allah made him to kill him. If he prisons somebody, Allah made him to put him in prison. So can you blame him for doing something that Allah asked him to do? No. So for that matter, 
they have all the right and all the privilege to do whatever they do and nobody has any right to ask them about why and why they do this. That is the reason why this started. And you can see this after the tragedy of Karbala. Mm -hmm. That when Imam Hussain after his shahada, when they brought the, 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 the family of uh, uh, Imam Hussain to the castle of Omar bin Sa'ad, uh, to, uh, to Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, as soon as they entered, he started to ask them, what are those people? What are their names? Right? And they got to Imam Zayn al-Abidin. They said, what is his name? They said, Ismuhu Ali. He said, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. He said, awalaysa qad katala Allahu Aliya. Isn't Allah already killed Ali? Now listen to the question. Isn't Allah killed Ali? Imam Zayn al-Abidin responded, he said, كان لي أخن. I had a brother, Ali al-Asghar, Ali al-Akbar. قتله الناس. He was killed by people. See, he was saying that. قتله الله. Allah killed him. But Imam Zayn said, no, no, no. Don't ascribe the killing to Allah, but ascribe him to people. That is why, to tell people that, no, we are not bad as you think. Whatever we do, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's job. That is, from the Bani Umayyah. Now, the same, similar to this question was also said by Yazid in his castle too. That when the, they took the, 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 the Ali al-Bayt alayhi wa salam to the Damascus, as soon as they entered the castle and they were seated, Yazid, when he came, the first thing he says, he said that, Ya to Zainab, Ya Zainab, didn't you see how Allah treated your brothers and your families? That's what he was saying. Then Zainab said, Allah, she responded, she said, Wallahi ma ra'aytu illa jameela. I didn't see except beautiful. Whatever he does, Allah is, does is beautiful. He said, she, she, she continued. She says, those who get killed, ha'ula ikatab allahu alayhim al-qatil fabarazu ila mabajihim. Allah meant them to be killed those places and that happened by through the hands of people like you. Indicating that, yes, Allah knows that this will happen, but the ones who did the actual action is you, Yazid, and your people. So you, Bani Umayyah, they emphasize all years along, always trying to, to talk about Jabr, 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 so that way they can get the chance to do everything that they want and nobody should question them. And up to date, up to date, they, go, they have some hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim indicating about this. That if Allah choose any leader, whether the leader is Adil or Fasid, you have to be quiet because Allah chose him and not you. So the, the, the leader, he's killing, he's doing injustice, don't even open your mouth. Don't you read in the Quran, Allah says, He gives the kingdom to whom he wishes. Allah made him king, and that's how, we, how, that's how it has to be. And you and I, all we have to do is what? To surrender and listen to them. That's it. And between the parentheses, that is why you find less demonstration in the Sunni world than the Shia world. Because of this belief that everything the leader does is what? It's a choice of Allah and nobody should complain about. That is school of thought number one. And they're called Al Jabriya, Al Jababar. That's number one. Number two, they call Al Mufawwada. The second school of thought, Al Mufawwada. Now, quickly, let me write it on the board for those whom I want to know how it's written. The first group, group number one, is called Al Mujbera or Al Jababera. Number two, they are called Al Mufawwada. Okay. Al Jababera, this word, it comes from the word Jabr. Jabr means force. Meaning, a human being is forced to do whatever he does, and he has no any free will in whatever he does. That's where the Jabr comes from. Al Mufawwada, which is the, 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 the second group, it comes from the word Tafwid. Tafwid. 
Tafweed means what? It means to give all the right to someone where they get to make the decision about whatever they want to do and you have no saying about that. At Tafweed is the second group that who believes that when Allah created us as humans and after he completed our creation, Allah said to us, I have nothing to do with you now. In other words, I put it this way. It's like in the United States or the West Country. If you turn 18, you are on your own. I have nothing to do with you. You are an adult. Whatever you do with your life, go ahead. Right? So this is called what? At Tafwil. They say, after Allah created us, Allah said, now I wash my hands on you. I have nothing to do with you. Whatever you want to do, you go ahead and do it. Now you are responsible of yourself, whether you want to do good or bad, it's always your choice. Now I have nothing to do with that. This is called a tafwiyad. That Allah does not interfere in whatever decision, whatever khair or shari you do, it's all about you. Not, not only that, Allah cannot even intervene in things that you do. Because Allah, have already created you, and you complete, and now you let everything part to you. The same thing like here, as I mentioned, when you become 18, now your dad and mom cannot tell you things, do this and that, it's always up to you. Now, they have this similar thinking, that that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does to humans. That is school of thought number two. And this, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi afdal salatu was salam dealt with this in so many ways during his lifetime. There were these two groups during the time of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq where he has to deal with this so many times. And Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq when they ask him, are you with the group A al-Jababira or you are with the group B which is known as al-Mufawwada? Imam Jafar al-Sadiq responded, لا جبرا ولا تفويض لكن الأمر بين الأمرين Meaning, we are not with the first group which, are, which believe that everything we do is under the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, in other words with the Jababira, it's like you and I, we are just remote control. We are the robot, right? And Allah has the control. He press the button, you do this. He stop the button, you stop. Meaning you have nothing to do whatever you do with it. Whatever you do is the action of Allah. But the second one is no. Allah, after he created you, he gave you, he, as a robot, you have the own control and you are the one who does everything and Allah has nothing to do with it. Imam alayhi salam said no. Our belief as the Shia school of thought is somewhere in the middle. Meaning, you as a human being, you are not forced to do everything and you are not being given the power of everything. In other words, you are in the middle, which is you have a free will. Let me explain this better, brothers and sisters. Number one, why Imam said that we are in between? Meaning, there are certain things you and I in our life, you don't have any choice about it. There's no doubt about it. That Allah is the one who makes that decision. Whether you like it or not, too bad. Allah said, I make the decision and it's good for you anyway. Number one, some things like, who will be your mom and dad? Do you make that decision? No. You and I, we were born and mashallah, you look at your this mommy, this is daddy. Oh, okay, mom and dad, that's it. <laughs> Now who chose them? Allah chose them. You like it? Alhamdulillah. You don't like it? Too bad. You stop with them. <laughs> right? Now, this is the way that Allah makes the choice. Whether you like it or not, Allah said, it's my decision and it's about you and you have nothing to say whether you like it or not. That is number one. Number two, the day or the place you and I will die. Allah created this and he made that decision and it has nothing to do with you. Whether you like it, you cannot pick and say, no, I want to die on Monday. <laughs> you can't pick that. Allah didn't give you that choice. You cannot say, no, I want to die in New Zealand and I want to, for example, in Australia. I want to die in this. You cannot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes that decision.
And it's mentioned in the Quran, وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيَّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتٍ Allah said, no soul knows in which land he or she will die. Allah said, I kept that hidden. And I know when and where and what time a person's life will come to an end. You have no choice in that. That is number two. Number three, certain system that Allah created inside you, you have no choice. Now how the blood circles in your vein. Can you stop it? No. Can you push the button to start? No. Now, how does it work? Allah systemized them in your body and they follow the control of Allah whether you like it or not. You are sleeping, they're still working. You want them to stop? They say, no, the one who made us has told us to keep working. We want to keep working anyway. Anytime you want them to do something, they've already been systemized and they have to follow Allah's order and not your order. And you have nothing to do with that. You have no choice about it. That is in terms of certain things. So certain things, Allah didn't give you the option, but certain things, He gave you the option. Now what are those that He gave you option? Your actions that you do, you have all free of will. Free, you have the free will to do that. Anything that you do, whether you, anything that we, we do as a humans, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I give you that right and you have the right to do anything that you want under your control and you are responsible for your action. Number one of those actions, when you are hungry, responsible for your action. Number one of those actions, when you are hungry, you feel like eating, what do you do? You eat. When you sleepy, you feel like I'm tired, I need to go to bed. It's time to go to work. You don't you, you decide your own to go to work. Nobody tells you, nobody forces you, it's your own choice. Now to prove our free free uh, our free will, I'm gonna use three ways. One, the hadith, two, ayahs of the Quran, three is the logic. Because in the Shia school of thought, always our reasoning is based on three things. One is the first and the foremost is the Quran. Number two is the Hadith. And the Hadith coming from the Prophet or from the Imams. Number three is what? Is the logic and the reason. Now let's go to the Quran and see. Is there any indication in the Quran that every one of us has free will or not? Of course there are. There are so many ayahs in the Quran. Where Allah clearly indicates that we have free will. Ayah number one in Surah al dahr Surah Al-Insan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna hadaynahu sabil. We guided a man to the two paths. Imma shakiran wa imma kafura. That he can choose either to be what? The path of being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to choose the path of becoming ungrateful to Allah. Now becoming grateful, ungrateful, indicates what? Indicates about your free will. Because if you don't have free will, you cannot choose between the two of them. That is why angels, when Allah created them, they have no free will. Angels, they cannot say to Allah, no, I don't want to obey Allah, or I don't want to do my salah. Angels, from the day Allah created them, they have to obey Allah in every small and big, and they have no free will. And Quran indicates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them, La ya'asoon Allah ma amarahum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they do not disobey Allah. They cannot disobey Allah. Because that's how they were created. But human being, you and I, we have the free will. Sometimes we can say no to Allah, and sometimes we can say yes to Allah. And this is called al ikhtiyar So the first ayah we mentioned, Allah said, Imma shakiran. Allah said, we created a human being. And we get, we get him to, to the two paths. One path take him to, to become grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other path can take him to become ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the choice is his. The choice is yours. If you want to be that part which is becoming grateful to Allah, it's your choice. If you choose to go to Adara, it's also your choice. That is one ayah that indicates that you are, you and I, we have free will. That's number one. Number two, another ayah from the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُ 
Allah says, Ya Rasulullah, tell people that the truth is from their Lord. Faman sha'a. The word sha'a. Whoever wishes, falyu'min. Waman sha'a, falyakfur. Whoever wishes to believe, should do so. Whoever wishes not to believe, should do so too. So that indicates that you and I, we have free will. If we don't have free will, can we choose between believing and not to believe in Allah? Because when we say you have no free will, meaning you are only given one choice and no choice and no, no other choice. But Allah says, no, whoever wish, meaning there is a wish in there. That you can choose if you want to go there or you want to go there. That is also indicates that you have the free will of choosing between the right and wrong. That is ayah number two. Ayah number three in Surah Al-Balad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna hadaynahu an-najdain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, When we created human being, we guided him to the two paths. One path is what? Is the path of Allah. Then if you follow this path, it will take you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second one is the path of shaitan. If you follow this path, it's taking you to the hellfire. But then who has to make the choice? You and I. We have the choice that we can follow this or that. If we choose either one, it's all return to us and our choice, not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is ayah number three. Now let's come to the hadith. Abu Hanifa, one of the students of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam. One day he came to Imam Jafar al-Sadiq's house. And Imam Musa, the son of Imam Jafar, he was in, the, in his seven years or eight years, according to the narration. When he came, he wanted to test Imam Musa to see how smart he is. He asked him, Yabna, Yabna, Yabna Rasulullah, Mimman al -maksiyah. I want to know, when people commit sin, actually the sin, who commits it? Is it Allah or us? That was a question he put to Imam Musa, and he was eight years old. Imam alayhi salam said, Ya Abba Hanifa, this question that you just asked, it has some branches. He said, number one, the first option from this question is either we say that Imma min Allah, either Allah is the only one who do the sin, or two, he and humans together. The partners, Allah and human, both together, they commit the sin. That is number two. Number three, or either from human and not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Three choices. One, either Allah. Two, either both of them. Three, either human. Then Imam said, فَإِنْ كَانَ مِنَ Allah. If let's assume Allah is the one who does the sin, not us. He said, فَمَا يَنْبَغِي لِلْكَبِيرِ لِلْعَلِي أَنْ يُعَذِّبَ عَبْدَهُ بِذَنْبٍ لَمْ يَكْتَرِفْ He said, Allah, being a just Lord, would not punish his servant for sin that the servant didn't commit. Because the first one we said, he does the sin. But Ayyum Al-Qiyamah, there's punishment or not? There is. So Ayyum Al-Qiyamah, if he punish Zaid or Amr, why would he punish Zaid or Amr for sin that he committed and not the Zaid or Amr? That's number one. So number one is what? It's out. Because Allah doesn't do the sin. Number two, either we say both of them did the sin. One part is Allah, the other one is what? It's human. The first part is the wish of Allah. The second one is, no, a human being is the one who actually practiced the sin. But it was based on the wish of Allah. He said, فَمَا يَنْبَغِي لِلشَّرِيكِ الْأَكْبَرِ أَنْ يُعَذِّبَ الشَّرِيكِ الضَّعِيفِ He said, it doesn't make sense. Two partners, they join to do the crime, and then the other part, the, part, the other first partner, punish the other for the sin that they both committed. But if they both, Allah and them, committed the sin, Allah shouldn't punish the servant and not himself. Either they both get punished, or they both get released from the sin. But why would Allah punish us Yawm Al-Qiyamah and not him? He said that indicates that it's not from Allah. He said the third choice, Imma min al-abd, or it is from the servant. And the Imam said, Wahuwa minhu. 
And indeed, it's from him. Then whatever we do is from us and not with Allah or just Allah. And then he said, فَإِنْ أَذَّبَهُ فَبِذَنْبِ If he chooses to punish him, it's because of his sin. وَإِنْ أَفَى If he decided to forgive, فَبِرَحْمَتِ It's also based on his rahmat. But at the end, who does the sin? At the end, it's you and I who commit sin, not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the hadith part. Now, from the logic part. Now, you think about this. If you sit down and you look at yourself, do you think that you are being forced in anything that you do or you don't? Of course, you say no. Now, logic part, let's think about this. If you and I are going on this test right there, you have three options. Option number one, you can stop if you want to. Can't we? Yes. You can continue. Option number two. Option number three, you can come back. Can't you? When you're walking on the stairs, you can see, you can feel within yourself. No, I want to continue. No, I want to stop. No, I want to go back. All these options are in front of you. Whatever you want, you can choose any one of them. Can't you? Good. Now, let's say you go on top of the roof. Somebody pushes you. <laughs> now you're coming falling. Can you say, I want to stop. <laughs> I want to continue. I want to go back. Can you do that? No? Oh, what does he mean? That means that the first one, you have the choices. The second one, there is no one. There's no choice. Because the first one, you can stop willingly. You can continue willingly. You can come back. You have all the choice. But the second one, somebody pushes you. Is there any choice there? Of course not. There's only one choice. And that is you're falling on the ground. <laughs> now you think about it. When you do your actions, do you feel like the first one or the second one? Do you feel like when I stand to, to do my namaz, do I feel like I cannot stop anytime I want to? I have to finish this namaz, whatever the case is. Or you feel like, no, I am the one who chooses to stand in front of Allah. I am the one who chooses to do my namaz. I can choose to go back to bed. I can choose not to do my prayers. I can choose to watch movie. I can choose to do many things. But I chose to stand in front of Allah. This indicates you what? You have the free will. That is number four. Number three. Number four. Among ourselves. Among our lives. If today I said I'm driving a car. And I go and hit a cop's car. I say cop. Next listen. The police car. You go and hit the police car. He say police. Guess what? It's not my choice. It's not my fault. It's this car's fault. Because this is the car who hits you. So if you want to give a ticket, give it to the cop, not me. You think the cop is going to say, Wallah, what a wonderful saying. Yes, the cop, this is your ticket. Or he's going to say, are you serious? <laughs> Which one do you think is going to? Because he, does, he knows that you have the choice and the car doesn't have a choice. Because the car turns in the, any direction you choose the car to go. So even if the car hits, yes, the car did the hidden. But the choice of taking it left or right is in whose hand? It's in your hands. So at the end of the way, even among ourselves, we know that we have choices and we know that everything that we do, we have free will. So in our own actions, among ourselves, Muslim and non-Muslim, they all know that they, every one of us have free will. Another example. Sometimes you sit in. Your, somebody comes, mashallah, and kicks you. <laughs> Not you, inshallah, they kick somebody else. Right? Now you see them willingly, they kick. And then they say sorry. And then they kick again. And I say sorry. And then they kick again. And I say sorry. Are you going to accept that, that this is not their wish? Are you going to accept that? Or are you going to say, no, this is not a joke. Now let me show you how you can be sorry. Let me teach you how hard I can hit so you can feel how painful it is. Right? Because you know that when he hit one, two, three, it's by choice. But if somebody falls from the up and fall on you and he say, I'm sorry, do you know that he has, he, doesn't, he has no choice or no? The first one when he falls, you know this is not his choice. It's something that happened beyond his control. But the second one, when he takes his hand and hit, you know that this is why what? By choice. So the first one, when he falls, 
which is out of his control, you don't blame him because he has no control over it. But when he gets with his hand, you know that no, this is what is by choice, so he has to be held accountable. That indicates about what? About fear. Now, moral, logic part. If we say people are, they don't have free will. You know what that means? That means sending prophet and imam is useless. Think about it. Why? Now, what is the point of sending a prophet? To come and show us the right thing and the wrong, right? Now, if Allah already created Zayn to be a bad person, Amr to be good, what's the point of sending a prophet to change them? He cannot be changed. Because the point of sending a prophet is to come and show you the path so if you are making the wrong decision, you can change to go to the right decision. But if you already been set up to do the bad thing and you cannot change, and he has been set to do the good thing and he cannot change, then what's the point of sending the prophet? Then the prophet coming is what? It's zero benefit and it's useless. And we all know that the prophets, they have made changes in lives. When the Prophet first came to Mecca, uh, to, to, uh, to Mecca well, how, did, how, how did the people used to live? And how was the people after he left this world? A big change. So that means what? People have free will and free will does exist among us. That is another proof. Now another proof also about the free will of human. That everything we do, we have absolutely a free will. If there is no free will, you know, Jannah and Hellfire and Heaven is useless. Okay, what's the point when Allah, when, based on what point, Allah is going to send somebody to Heaven or send somebody to Hellfire? Based on what point? We know that, Yawm al Qiyamah, Allah sends somebody to Heaven because of their good deeds. Because they choose to do good deeds. And Allah sends some people to Hellfire because of their choice of making bad deeds. Now, if the person was already been designed to do bad deeds and get sent to the heaven or hellfire, that heaven and hellfire is useless. More than that, which is the most important part. If we believe that human being has no free will, you know what that means? That means we are saying that Allah is a zalim and oppressor. How? Now, for example, a mother tells her son, Hey son, get me a water from the, from the refrigerator. The child brings the water, and then you take the same water and heat on his face. Say, what? <laughs> Say, you brought me a water? Oh, yeah, you told me to bring water. Yes, I did, but I'm going to heat you anyway. <laughs> it make any sense? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Yazid to be Yazid, right? And Yawm al Qiyamah, He takes him and put it in the hellfire. Yeah, Allah, you made him who he was. Okay, what's the point of punishing him? <laughs> That means Allah is what is become an oppressor because he made this person to be who he was and he followed exactly the way he was but at the end of the day he has to be punished. Which makes Allah an oppressor. And at the same time it doesn't give any value to mu'mineen. Yom al Qiyamah who say mu'mineen have respect. Why? Because they made the best choice. Now, if they were made to be like that, they have no any respect. Because they didn't do it on, on, uh, by choice. They, were, they did it by force. And that is why we say, angels have no heaven and hell. Heaven does not exist for the, for, for the angels. Why? Because whatever good they do is not based on their choice. They were created to be like that. So, Yom al Qiyamah, Allah doesn't give them heaven or hellfire. Only people who go to heaven and hellfire is what? It's the jinn and human because we are the only two creatures who have the free will to say yes to Allah or no to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And based on these two choices, either Allah sends us to heaven or sends us to hellfire based on the choices. So at the end of the day, we believe based on the Quranic verses, based on the hadith of the prophet, based on the logic, we agree that every human being has been given the opportunity of free will. That every action that we do is our own choice and not Allah's one more time. And based on those actions, Allah will punish me Yom al Qiyamah or will reward me because of the choices that I made and not Allah's one more time. So that is briefly about our faith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
is the one uh, when he created us he gave us the free will and Allah stated in one of the ayahs he says Allahu Allah said I do not do any injustice to any of my servants Walakin anfusahum yadlimun. Allah said if you see any injustice it's from my servant themselves and not from me and thinking about the Jabriya or about being a person that who doesn't have free will, that is absolutely indicates about the operation of Allah to his seven. And Allah doesn't do, doesn't do any operation. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Now we go to the question and answers. Yes, please. Couple of questions. I'll ask the first one. Yes. About the Masumin, did they have a choice or were they sort of programmed to not make any sense? Yes. That's a good question. In our belief, of course they have choice. Because if first, number one, if they don't have choice, then there is no point of them being our role model. They're role model because Islam tells us that they are like you. But they did as great as they got, so learn to become like them. But if they already programmed and they have no choice, they do whatever they did because of the way they were created, then how can I become like them when I'm not programmed like that? So automatically, our Imams, they have, and the Prophet, they all have free will like you and I. And they chose to follow the teachings of Allah as high as they can and they became who they are. So yes, our Imams and us are on the same level and they are also humans with the free will and they can choose to do the right thing or the wrong thing. But they, what did they do? They closed the door of the bad deeds and kept the door of obedience of Allah open all the time. But then it brings us to the question that yes. the Muslims are... Um are infallible. They, they cannot make any mistake. They were created from the nur of Rasul al Khada. Mm -hmm. So how can they, uh, how can we even think of them in human body and I mean, uh, how can we, I know this is something that has always uh, kind of uh, puzzled me that um, at a time of grief, we always say that Imam Hussain, look at Imam Hussain and his family, right? Yes. Uh, and uh, But it's very difficult um, to connect when we know that uh, they were, they were, they were Imams, they were created even before the uh, earth, solar system or anything, you know, they were there before anybody, right? Like Rasul al uh, they were created from the Noor of Rasul al right? Yes. So how can we say that they had the free will and they uh, they kind of uh, they they did not choose to do bad evil? They were not created to choose uh, to, to to do bad things. And then again, it again brings to the second question that how can we relate to them uh, bad things? And then again, it again brings to the second question that how can we relate to them uh, when they were uh, they were like. Good question. Number one, <clears throat> our prophets and the imams, they were created like any one of us with the free will. They were created that if they want to do bad deeds, they can. Adam alayhi salam, didn't he disobey Allah at one point? Where Allah sent him out? If he wants, he could. Yunus alayhi salam, didn't he got swallowed by the whale when he did go against the will of Allah at some point? Also, Ibrahim al Khalil, most of the Prophet, if they want to, they can. See, we have what we call, what you talk about is called Isma. And Isma means infallibility. But let me tell you this the word the Isma in Arabic does not have a proper translation in English. When you look at the dictionary in English, infallible means what? Somebody who cannot commit sin. But that's not what Isma means. No, our Imams and the Prophet, they can if they want to sin, but they chose not to sin. The word Isma for the angels, yes, it means infallibility. Because when we have Isma, 
it has two types. There is isma ikhtiari and isma jabri, the word jabra. Somebody cannot commit sin like the angels. The angels cannot wake up and say, today I don't feel like doing this be of Allah. They cannot. Because they were programmed not to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the angels. But our Imams and the Prophet, they were not programmed like that. They were created as a humans. They can sin if they want to. That's why the Prophet, they ask him, Ya Rasulullah, the shaitan comes to you like he comes to us? The Prophet say, of course he does. But the difference between me and you is that my shaitan has surrendered in front of me. In other words, he has reached to the cruise level where shaitan cannot cause any turbulences for him. But for you and I, we haven't reached there, so he can cause a lot of problems for us. Sometimes even divert us from the right path. But the Imams and the Prophet, yes, they are. They have the free will. And if you read in Dua al Nudba, it's very clear. Allah stated there in Dua al Nudba, where Allah is talking about the Imams. He said, Remember when you choose them. In Alam al in Alam al Allah chose them, right? But then Allah took commitment from them that would you obey me? And we took from all of us too. Don't think that just them. All of us. But what did we do? Some of us said, yeah, we think about it. Some of us, yeah, we do it. Some of us, I'm not sure. Some of us, sure. And these are the prophet, the imams. That in me, and in the, in the dua, the dua not be mentioned. They say, sharatta lahum al-zuhuda fi a'la hadhi dunya wa alimta minhum al-wafa'a bidhalik. When they give you the commitment, and you knew from the beginning, that they will fulfill their promise. So Allah knew from the, from the beginning that these people, whatever they give their commitment, they will stick to it. They will obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they have the free will, but they are able to overcome that negative part, which is the sin, and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every one of us, see, when we say Isma, Isma, Isma comes in different level, by the way. It's not just one level. We have Al Isma Surah and we have Isma Al Kubra. Al Isma Surah, sometimes they say like Zainab Salamullah Aliha, she is Ma'asuma, but Isma Al Isma, the Isma Al Surah. You have Abu Fadl al Abbas, he's Ma'asum, but Isma Al Surah. Abu Ali al Akbar, Ma'asum, but Isma Al Surah. Meaning the minor infallibility, but then there's major infallibility. And this Isma also has this, it has come different level. Even to some points, we hear some of us are ma'asum in certain cases. Number one, did you ever think at one point that I want to go and hit an orphan for no reason? Maybe you never even want to wake up and have that thought in your mind. Always what comes in your mind, oh, what can I do khair for any orphan? Right? Well, that's the isma because it doesn't even come to your mind to go and commit sin in that, in that angle. You always think about the positive. That itself is called some sort of Isma. So Isma is what? It's when you get to the point where you try to control yourself not to even look or do anything that is obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Imams, they have got to that level where they close because there are two doors. Remember we said, Hadaynaw sabila imma shakiran wa imma kafura. You have the two doors. One door is what? The door of shaitan and the door of Allah. Some people, they were able to close the door of shaitan and keep one door of open. That's the door of Allah. And that is the level of imams. And you and I, trust me, we can do that too. Every one of us can. Example, Salman. Salman is Pharisee. What did the Prophet say about him? Salmanun minna ahl al bayt. Salman was pure servant of Allah to the point he elevated himself, and I call him what? Salman overtaker. He came. People were in the race towards Allah. He came. He passed. He was Jew. He was what in Iran? He was a what do you call fire worshiper. He left that, he became Christian. He left that, he became a Jew. He left that, he became a Muslim. And he came, even those who were already Muslim ahead of him, he passed them and became one of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wasalam. And the same Ahlul Bayt level, the wives of the Prophet came and the Prophet said, no, you cannot be in. But Salman was put in. 
جبرائيل اسال الله يا الله هل اهبط الى الارض لاكون معهم سادسا جبرائيل not be one of them but Salman didn't even ask the prophet brought him in because of his action so this level every one of us can all it takes is what is about a close obedience to Allah the higher you put a pressure on you and close the door of shaitan and open the door of Allah the higher you become in the sight of Allah and the more you go the more less shaitan becomes over come and uh, have control over you so our imams they have that free will and any one of us can do that that's why see the Quran Allah say was typical khairat compete Meaning there's no we can do that. Compete with whom? Go with, like, with the Prophet and the Imams. Yes, because of our circumstances, we might not be able to get to their level. But if we want to, we can. So the choice is there. So we have choices and they have choices as well. That is that angle. The second angle which you ask, which is about... Um, being uh, Noor, yes. Being the descendant of the Prophet. Okay, all of us from the descendant of the Prophet too. You are from Adam, I'm from them, you, everybody. We all came from Adam, and Adam is a Prophet too. <laughs> Don't we? Our father is Adam, and Adam is a Prophet. But being a son of Prophet doesn't make you good or bad. Your action is what makes you good and bad. No, alayhi salam, he had a son, Canaan, right? Biological son, end up in hellfire. So a son or related to somebody doesn't mean anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What means something is the action. A wife related to a husband that is prophet means nothing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A wife is good, the husband is bad, doesn't mean anything to Allah. You can see all these examples in the Quran. Number one, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, he had a wife who was bad and Allah promised a hellfire. You have Asiya, her husband was a frown. Who was the evil one on the planet of that time? But she's going to have it and he's going to have fire. So in the Islam, what matters is the action. Yes, you can come from the Prophet. If you don't do the action of that Prophet, you have no respect in the sight of Allah. Because Allah has already set it the criteria in Surah Al-Hujrat. Ya ayyuhan nas inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha. Allah said, all you these creatures, we created you from two people. One is Adam and one is Hawa. Wa ja'alnakum shu'uban. And we created you from different tribes and nations. But Allah said, remember one thing. Inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaqum. Allah said, the best of all among you is the one who fears Allah. Now, I'm a son of the Prophet, doesn't matter to Allah. I'm a son of any masoom, it doesn't matter to Allah. Your action is your action. Your father's action is his action as well. So the bottom line is that, even if you come from the Prophet's side, as long as you're doing the job of the Prophet, yes, you get what? You get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yes, the Prophet and the Imams, they were created from the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they have all that high level that Allah mentioned in the Quran, but this is not because of their nur. It's all because of their action. Now listen to the Quran. What did Allah say to the Prophet? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya Rasulullah, wa min al-layli fatahajjad bihi nafilatan lak. Ya Rasulullah, when the night comes, wake up. Do what? Do the nafila, the night of the namaz al-shab, the night salah. He said, Asa an ya ba'athaka. Allah will raise you to the level you will be pleased with. So that means, him becoming a nur from the beginning is not enough. You have to do something. Action. You have to do the salat al-layl. Allah said, Ya Ayyul Muzammi, Kum al-layla illa qalila. Stand up and do your namaz night. Okay, he's a noor. Allah will say, okay, you from the noor, don't worry about it. Sleep, inshallah, coming, your ticket is ready to go to heaven. No, Allah didn't say that. He said, you have to. Our imams, our imam, Ali, uh, imam Hussein, the night of Ashura, what did he say? When they wanted to attack, he said, no, 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 don't attack us tonight. We want to do what? We want to do namaz, read Quran, and get most of it before we go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ali, Imam, Imam Jafar, the night of his shahada. What did he say? He said, I want to read Quran. And he told all his companions and his family, he said, anyone who comes Yawm Al-Qiyamah doesn't take his salah seriously, he said, he has no shafa from us. 
So the bottom line is what? It's action, action. And that is what, even in the Quran, any place Allah said, Alladheena amanu wa amilu salihat. They believe and they act upon it. Action is the foundation in Islam. Whether the person is a mu'min or a kafir, or whether the person is a prophet or is not a prophet, the bottom line is the action that the person does between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. I'm sorry. There was a question from me. I have a question just about you know, yes, the same, same topic. Yes, so just a comment. Yes. You mentioned this uh, supplication of Tuesday last time. Yes. Uh, narrated by Imam Zainal Abdin. Yes. Was There's a very beautiful verse in that which says, Allahumma aslah li deeni fa inahu asma tu namari. Correct my deen because it brings isma to my, my action. That's right. So I think we have all the... Absolutely. Things. Absolutely. And let me say this. See, our actions in ilm al-irfan and akhlaq, they mention that are our actions, any action that we do, good or bad, it comes in three stages. Stage number one is called Al-Hal. That when we do any action, in the first stage, it might continue, it might not. And then sometimes it might continue, it might fade out, and that's it. It's gone. Number two is called uh, Al-Ada. The same action, if you continue to do them, they become like accustomed to you. Whether it's good or bad. Now, as you continue to do the same action over and over and over, then it changes to become what we call malaka. It becomes part of you that you cannot stop anymore. Now, if a person is always scared of darkness, right? doesn't want to be in a place that is dark. How can he overcome that? They say continuously go into darkness over and over. The more you go, this action, maybe the first time you get scared, the second time, the fourth time, the fifth time, if you continue, it becomes like a norm to you. Now the same norm, if you continue over and over and over, it will become like your life, part of you, that some people, they cannot sleep when there is a light on. You just sleeping. You turn off the light. They turn on. They, they, they just wake up. Why? Because it has become part of them that wherever they sleep, it has to be dark. That is the action of human being. So when you get to that level, it's like the level of Isma. At that level, nothing can come back. Yes, sometimes Shaitan can put somebody down, even if you get that. That's why when you're there, you have to protect it. To protect and maintain that level all the time. Because Shaitan can come even in that level to, 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 what you call, to change the person's direction. Like they mentioned, Imam al Khomeini, rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi, he has set up the, the time of his Salat al layl. That, that time, as soon as the time comes, it doesn't matter how long day he had, it doesn't matter where he is, he automatically wakes up at that time. That is called Darajatul Malaka. Some of us, if you pray all the time, when the time of Salat comes and pass and you don't pray, you don't feel comfortable. You feel like something is missing. You have to do something. Until you do your namaz, then you feel, ah, alhamdulillah. Now it's called Dardatullah, Malaka. Now it becomes part of you that you cannot stop. So our action is when you get to that level of Malaka, it's very, it's like something we call Isma Sora. It's very hard to stop at that level. So we all have that sort of Asthma at one point. Some people have high, some people have less, and so of that. Oh, good. You had a question? Yeah. I good. Yes. Um, in um, my question is about Surah Bani Israel and I think Surah Ibrahim. Yes. They have about Shadri Maduna. Yes. And I have heard somewhere that it is mentioning about the family of Yazid or Mavia. Um, is that really? Is that really true? My question to you is that first part. And the second part is that if it is true, then, then again is uh, a mentioning of this and if this uh, came at the time when Prophet was there and it says uh, the, a hadith about this surah, uh, ayah. So <coughs> is that possible that Yazid have known about it and they could have said that, okay, this is my name is already there? That Yazid said, I mean, if they say that oh, I, uh, my ayah about 
there is an ayah about me, shajr maluna. I mean, if this is, they say that this ayah, I have heard that this ayah is about the family of but, Yes, Bani Umayyah. Yeah, Bani Umayyah. Yes. So, that time, at the time when it came, then Yazid could have said that, okay, my man, name is already mentioned in Quran as a shajr maluna. So, where is that? comes like, you know, free will, and then he said that, okay, I am already been as a bad person. Mm-hmm. Destiny. Destiny. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Um, yes, we have some uh, yeah, some hadith from the Holy Prophet and some of the tafsirs also, yes, indicate that that when this ayah was revealed, because we have two trees that Allah mentioned. One is called Shajaratun Tayyibatun Asluha Thabitun Wa Far'uha Fissama. Shajara Tayyiba, a pure tree that is rooted in the ground strongly and it gives its fruit. So Allah mentioned that, that is one. And then the other one is, yes, was Shajaratul Mal'unata fil Qur'an, where is uh, the cursed tree in the Qur'an. Yes, some scholars mention that as Shajarat Tayyibah is referred to Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam and the Prophet's descendant. The second one, yes, they mentioned that, yes, is about Ahlul uh, Bani Umayyah. 